you no, can just do the recording. There we go. I'm happy to see Lindy were here. I'm very happy to see her here. Lindy were absolutely. She recommended you right from the beginning, Walter. And, uh, Yes, I've, I've, I've let her down a couple of times, but I'll do right. Thank you. You still owe me, by the way. You still owe I me. Do. <laughs> <Yeah>. I do. <laughs> I do. Okay, we've got about 20, 23, 24 people online now. So I think it's. Uh, yeah, let's, let's start. We've got quite a lot to cover. So yeah, just again, Walter, uh, welcome. And, and as I said, we, we're really looking forward to the session. Uh, so today we're gonna talk again about uh, uh, bit, valid, uh, bit validity and the extension of those bit validities. And there were obviously a court case uh, recently, Kuleni court case that, that I know you're gonna take us through. And then also, I know there were also quite a while back was the Talcum court case that we had around tender validities. Um, but, but first, also, maybe over to you and just to understand a little bit more about yourself and if you can just introduce you and, and your background a little bit. Uh, I know you're from the AG's office, as Sean mentioned, but maybe you can just give us a little bit more in terms of your background. Okay. Also, I think you're unmuted. Uh, if you can unmute, thanks. I think I muted there when I was on your talking, but I was saying thank you very much for the invite. I'm very happy to be here. I've been wanting to come for a while, but scheduling conflicts and the like were really, really taking time off from me. Um, I like to call myself the adopted child of supply chain management or the adopted child of procurement. And that's because obviously, uh, some will know, I'm not your typical public procurement practitioner. So if you speak of things such as strategic sourcing, I know about the matrix as it relates to ap applying it, but not as a qualification. So I, I see myself as an adopted child and I'm happy that the SCM or the public procurement family has welcomed me with, 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 with open arms. I've been doing this type of training or awareness sessions or conferences since about 2015 in different platforms. So some of you perhaps may have seen me in different platforms and the, and the like. Um, but actually, I'm, I'm, uh, by profession, I'm a lawyer. I'm legally qualified, just that I had a keen interest in public procurement and made sure that I focused a lot of my time within public procurement and reading the case law, but not only that, contextualizing it to how you do the day-to-day -day running of supply chain to the extent that I spent two years purely doing supply chain, not even legal work, but supply chain work. I even worked quite closely with SIPs because I really wanted to make sure that I've got a practical understanding of supply chain uh, management. And that's why you know, I've got a passion for public procurement. So today's session, as Henry has rightly put, is in relation to a court case that has just come out quite recently. And I was quite interested in that particular topic because it, it touches on a couple of matters that I think as public procurement practitioners, you should have front and center at all times. And earlier this morning, I happened to come across a particular infographic on LinkedIn. For some of you will know that I do spend some time on LinkedIn sharing sharing some, some insights and also getting some insights from them. And this infographic was one about how the popularity of certain websites have grown or decreased since 1993. So if you remember around that time, 1993, an MSN was the most popular, for instance, uh, search engine. And then we moved towards the, just before 2000 to the 2000s, and Yahoo became the biggest search engine. But today, 2022, if I say, when last did you use Yahoo as a search engine, you will definitely not remember when last you did, or if you ever did. So some may say, but how is this particular story relevant to validity periods? And it's because it, planning is something that is essential and critical to public procurement. 
And Yao will never at all planned to actually fall down the ranks to the extent that no one even remembers that Yahoo has a search engine and now it's Google. In the same way that Google would have planned how it was going to actually grow its business to the extent that Google is the top website in the world and YouTube, which is also in the same company, is now number two, actually even ahead of uh, Facebook. So the reason I'm raising this story is because planning is a critical part of public procurement. And it's always best when you have such sessions to talk about things that are relatable and not only stick to the technical nuances of public procurement as an example. So at least the story can stick with you as you go about your day-to-day -day work. And SCM, you know, is one of the toughest jobs that I've ever had. And I'm sure you can relate yourselves that SEM is quite a difficult aspect, but it's also fun. So the reason I say it's also fun is because obviously you get to see how the entire organization works. You get to see what the organizational needs are, and you get to become an enabler of those business needs because most of you sitting here are not sitting in organizations where procurement is the core function of your organization. You actually play a support function and you rely very heavily on the dependencies from business. So when I say business, it means your company and the people who hold certain decision-making powers within your organization. So even if you're, you've got those frustrations, it's still fun because you get to see how you can navigate those. But there's always pitfalls in supply chain and most of the pitfalls in supply chain, you might not even be able to predict. But as time goes and you get more experience and you start doing scenario planning, you end up getting to a point where you're able to actually spot some of your blind spot or spot a particular risk coming from a mile away. And this becomes even more relevant within the public procurement space. Because when you're procuring within the private sector, for example, yes, there are rules that must be followed. Yes, there are matrix that you must apply. But in terms of the legislative framework, it is less stringent on the private side as it is more stringent in the public sector side. So it's always important that when you look at cases like the Ekurulini case, you will find that most of the time procurement cases are steeped in public uh, procurement. So it's quite important that, you know, even as I speak to you today, you realize that you know I will have those elements of public procurement, but the lessons learned there can be used anywhere else. And speaking to the converted, preaching to the converted, when you speak about public procurement, it is an example, and this can resonate on the private sector as well, is that public procurement is steeped in five core principles. And I'm sure in your previous sessions, you've multiple times had an opportunity to actually dissect each and every one of those five elements. And these elements, you will see how it dovetails back to the whole procurement process and how it dovetails back to planning and how it dovetails finally to why validity period is the core topic of today. So the first aspect there in public procurement or in procurement as, as a whole is that you must be able to procure in a cost effective manner. So there's no one who wants to pay more than they should be paying. And I mean, just look at the petrol price as we speak now. We are really struggling with the petrol price because we don't want to pay a cent more. If it was up to us, we would drop it to as low a level as possible. But even in procurement, we speak about cost effectiveness there as well. And when you look at cost effectiveness, you need to plan in advance to ensure that you can be able to maximize your economies of scale and yield the necessary cost effectiveness so that you can get the best possible product, but also at a price that is cost effective for the business. Because if you don't look at costs, you will end up procuring to such an extent that you will not be able to recover and you must close business. This is the same with the validity period to say within the, within the validity period of a procurement process, the procurement process needs to be cost-effective. It needs to be cost-effective for you as the procurer, 
but also it needs to be cost effective for whichever bidders want to submit their bids towards you. So you must always look at it from both sides. When you're a procurer, also think about the service provider because there's going to be a relationship that is going to be happening there. The second element is obviously the competitiveness uh, thereof. And again, when you go into the market in advance and you plan, you make sure that you know, you've got as many competitors as possible because you want to be able to have a wider choice. It's, there's one thing that is frustrating where you, for instance, go out on tender and only one service provider comes on board. You will never be able to really fully test them against other service providers and perhaps there are certain things that you might have missed from during your planning phase that could be key during that competitive bidding uh, process and as an example. And that's why during a validity period as well, and you'll see, keep going back to that and you'll see how it ties back at the end, that during the validity period is where their competitors. It's like for those who like soccer, they talk about the Premier League or the PSL, that everyone is competing to be number one. So as it relates to public procurement or any procurement, you want a competitive nature to be, to be there. But one of the most important aspects there is the one about transparency. And when you talk about transparency, it's even in the constitution, it, it features quite significantly across the board that in whatever you do, you must be as transparent as possible. So whether you're transparent internally in your organization or transparent externally towards your service provider or externally to whoever has got oversight duties over you, it is important that the procurement process is as transparent as possible. And you'll see why as it relates to the validity period as an example, you need to be very transparent as to why you've put in the validity period, how long the validity period is and what happens once the validity period ends or if you extend it, what are the consequences or the implications of that particular aspect? So that's quite key as well as it relates to that element. And also another element which you know you will know is that it must be a fair process. The courts are very much interested in the last two elements, which are fairness and equity. So when you go to court, for instance, and you seek relief, one of the main things that a court will do, especially when you go all the way to the constitutional court, is to make sure that there is a fair and equitable remedy to assist, for instance, a service provider and also assist the organization. And I know sometimes when a tender is declared invalid, you know, you may say, but that's not fair, it's not equitable, how is it assisting us to do service delivery? But it is quite important to have a balancing act. And it reminds me of another case that came out this uh, a few months ago, which talks about the fact that if a tender then gets canceled, right, should, for instance, a court give you know the successful bidder out of out of out of pocket expenses, and that's a debate for another day. We can even have a session about that judgment. It's a fantastic judgment because it laid the ground to say if you have won a particular tender, and then maybe you know, you've just started, and now you you've spent a lot of money, the tender is cancelled, for instance, as a as a, as, a, as a company, should you at least be entitled to what we call out of pocket expenses, but not to claim for profits, but that's a story for another day. And as, as public procurement practitioners or practitioners of procurement as a whole, you will always remember that from a practical level, let's leave the law for a minute. You know, I'm a lawyer, yes, but let's leave the law for a minute. You will know that procurement is steeped in four critical elements, right, from a, from a practical point of view, and I call them the four Ps. So the first one is planning, and planning is going to be the core of our discussion today. Planning is a very key component of public procurement because if you don't plan, it is where you'll not be able to meet your milestones. It is where you'll be, you will end up, for instance, procuring the wrong service or product. And if you don't plan, you, the entire value chain and the value that you bring as public procurement practitioners or private procurement practitioners goes out the window. So planning becomes an essential component. And when you talk about, for instance, a validity period, you need to be able to plan. So ordinarily, you know, you would give, for instance, 180 days for a validity period. And obviously, if there's more time, you can then extend it accordingly. But planning also extends to making sure that you know when and how you're going to be engaging, for instance, with your service providers. And that is why it's important to have, for instance, a demand plan well in advance 
which you will then be able to follow through. The second part after you planned is then you go into what you call the procurement process. So the procurement process as an end-to-end -end type of value chain speaks about you advertising a particular tender with the necessary specifications that you would come up with during your planning phase and giving enough time for bidders to be able to respond as an example to, for instance, this particular bid, but also for you to have enough time to evaluate, to adjudicate, and finally to award. So up until the award date, that is what the procurement phase, which is the second P, is as it relates to public procurement or any other procurement that you might, you might have. The third P speaks to what I call post-procurement. So post-procurement means that you've now awarded and you now go into the contracting phase. So the contracting phase is a twofold. One, you come up with terms and conditions that will ensure that for the duration of that particular contract, you are able to actually deliver this particular service, but also you, are, you also negotiate even further as it relates to the pricing as an example. Obviously, if you've got the latitude and alacrity to be able to, to do so. So you'll find that this post-procurement phase is the one that the court you know, stops at. And I'll explain what I mean by that in terms of the aspect of the validity period. Then the fourth P, obviously, as, as, as practitioners you would know, is the one about performance. So the last P is performance. A lot of the times, you know, sometimes people assume that uh, procurement practice that job ends once the tender is awarded and the contract has been signed. For some, that particular, for instance, work goes beyond in terms of monitoring the performance of a service provider. One, because you want to make sure that you abide by what you said you will give us. But two, from a planning perspective, it helps you for the next time you got on tender again to know what are the pitfalls, what are the highs and the lows in that particular regard. So that's as an introduction, something I thought I must give so that at least you can then link it back and tie it back to what this matter is about and what this case is about. Obviously, what I've just said now, you won't find in the judgment, but just because a judge is there to simply look at the law, and in some instances, if the law is impractical, then, it's, it's, then, then, then actually delves into that. But for me, I thought this would be a fantastic introduction for us to be able to direct, to, to, to direct this thing. So the next thing that I want us to understand, and is quite critical, is that we need to view the procurement process as if it's a contractual arrangement. We need to view the procurement process as if it was a contractual arrangement. What does that mean? It means that once you go out there and advertise a tender, right, there are rules that you put in place on how to make sure that you can procure in a cost-effective, competitive, fair, transparent, equitable manner, right? So those are the rules. And you'll find that with, the, with an advert already, the, the, main, the, the, the first set of rules are already set in that tender advert, for an example. The second set of rules are then found in the bid document. So when someone then wants to respond, they will get access, for instance, to the bid document. And those bid documents, if you look at them in theory, they've got contractual terms themselves. And within those contractual terms, right, you will find something, for instance, to say, this is when the tender starts, this is when the advert ends, this is how long the evaluation should take, this is by when, at the latest, we would want to make sure that this tender is awarded, and then this particular contract, as it were, comes to an end. So if you look at it from that perspective, that, for instance, the, the tender process is contractual in nature, it will help you a lot because it then keeps you honest in an objective manner to be able to meet what you need to do. So it ties back to that planning phase to say you will then plan what must be in that contractual arrangement at all times. That way, you can avoid a lot of issues that might come out from bidders that are disgruntled for it. Because as I said, you also want to continue having fun as, as, as procurement practitioners because you get to see different types of services and products in that regard. So we need to be able to look at it from that, uh, from that perspective and be as meticulous as possible, but also make sure that you set timelines and conditions that are flexible enough 
for you to be able to maneuver because it's one thing to have what you call malicious compliance or strict compliance to certain rules when you can actually spread them across. But please I reiterate, make sure it's within the bounds of the law, especially if you're in a highly regulated space, right? If there's specific timeline that you must be met in terms of the law, obviously you can't deviate too much from those. But if there's you know, room for discretion, apply it as long as you apply that discretion in a rational and reasonable and procedurally fair manner. So that is quite important. And this is where we then get to the case before us. And the case before us, as Henry has rightly so stated, is as it relates to Ekuru learning, and whereby one of the service providers, after a particular tender had been, had been awarded, and I think to the extent that the, even the service providers had started working, and you know, sometimes, you know, the court process takes a while, uh, it got to a point where the court was of the view that the, the tender process was actually invalid, or second, that the tender process had ended, and therefore, there should never have been an award. But before the Ekuruleni case could run, the telecom case had to crawl. Before the telecom case could crawl, the Gablin case had to be born. And I say this because obviously when you look at case law, it is not always the case that a case is in a vacuum. There may have been, in some instances, another case with similar facts or similar principles that came about. And it is quite important that, you know, as, 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 as procurement practitioners, you get to understand how the courts interpret, for instance, our, our procurement, whether it's public procurement or your normal private procurement, as it were. It is quite key that we take out those lessons because if we don't learn from those principles, if we don't learn from those cases, we are bound to make the same mistakes again. You know, there's always talk about uh, madness is doing the same things, even though, for instance, it's not yielding the, the, the requisite results. E eventually, you need to be able to course correct. And I think we've moved into a space where in procurement, we can be able to innovate we can be able to be flexible. We can be able to set to stick to certain principles because it also helps from a consistent, consistency point of view, but it also helps for you to be as objective as possible. The procurement process must be as objective as possible. So the first part that I wanted to just to speak about is the four principles that have been set, for instance, by the telecom case and the, the, the CL captain case, is that firstly, the decision to award a tender, and I'm talking specifically here within public procurement, the decision to award a tender is administrative action. So this is where I want to pause for a bit, and it's quite important. Paja. So, Paja, yes, you're quite right. So Paja, right, which is the Promotion of Access to Justice Act, is born out of Section 33 of the constitution that says that you must always have in place, you know, just and just action, just administrative action, for instance. And when we talk about just administrative action, what I'm talking about here is that whatever decisions you make as an administrator, and in public procurement, you become the administrator, the accounting officer becomes an administrator. Whatever you do, it must be done in a procedurally fair manner. So that's the first one that you need to remember at all times. When you do an administrative action, this is a principle from the case, is that it must be done in a procedurally fair manner because it is an administrative action, which can be challenged in terms of hard job. And where else did we see the word fair, for instance? We saw fair, for instance, as it relates to the elements of public procurement, that a procurement process must be fair. So again, with an administrative action, the very same principle comes here as well, that it must be fair. So when you talk about fairness, it talks about how you treat your bidders, how you treat your successful suppliers, for instance. It must be a fair, and it must not only be skewed towards you, because even in contracting the border case at the Constitutional Court say that even when you put in contractual terms, they must not be skewed to you 
as the so-called powerful party, they must be fair, even if we are contracting with, this, with the small service provider for a lack of a better term, of course. So with administrative action, we must always remember that it must be procedurally fair. Whatever decision you make must be reasonable. So when you talk about reasonability, and you talk about the reasonability test as an example, if you set, for instance, a validity period of 10 days, is that reasonable? Perhaps it might not be reasonable because bidders, one, might not see the advert on time, might not be able to do it, a quick turnaround with whatever they need to supply you with. But sometimes perhaps you will say, no, I want a quick turnaround time because there's an emergency. The law does allow exceptions. I always say with the law, you, I'll give you an answer, but a good lawyer was saying, but it depends. You mustn't be a lawyer and let's say this is the hard and fast rule. There is no depends. It depends. So you must always be reasonable in the way that you, 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 you take a decision when you award a particular tender, for instance. And the other aspect is that you must be rational. There must be logic to what you do. You, so that's why the planning phase that I spoke about earlier on is the one that assists you to be logical in the way that you work. So if, if you put in place a validity period, you must be able to know that those people who sit in the valuation committee, for instance, have got enough time. I mean, in the beginning I was saying, you know, I wish I had time to come and speak to this platform earlier. And one of you said, you know, you must make time, right? But obviously within the workspace and with the valuation committees that have got cross-functional individuals, as an example, it's always difficult to tie down people, uh, for instance, to sit in a session. So you need to be able to be rational in saying that I'm setting this validity period, I'm setting these meetings for the evaluation. I must be able to hold at a particular point because all of that will be tested in terms of PAJA should the decision to award a tender, for instance, be brought before the courts. And obviously with PAJA, this is a different review from the one on legality. And you find that most organs of state are bound by PAJA as opposed to the principle of legality. But that's another session on its own that we can always run at another stage should you, should you require it. So the first principle that I set there is that you must make sure that uh, you understand that PAJA is applicable when you do actually award a tender. The second principle is that once a contract, once, once you award and you contract with the service provider, and this is why it's quite key for this particular case at, with a Kurulani because there was an extension after the procurement process had ended, is that once obviously you contract the law of contract then kicks in. So procurement law falls away and the law of contract kicks in. So that's how we must be able to dovetail between how we move from the procurement law phase up to the contracting law phase. And, and the court was very clear to say that we need to understand that from the get-go because it will assist with the third principle. The third principle here, because I'm talking about the overarching principle, I'm gonna go into the specifics right now, is that if the pro procurement process is not followed correctly, then the contract that comes after that is invalid. So think about the fruit from the poisonous tree. You know, we talk about the, 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 the biblical as well, uh, apple in the Garden of Eden, that once you ate it, right, whatever Convenient you had, you know, I'm trying to be, I'm being a pastor now, whatever convenient you had with God, for instance, then became invalid. Think about it like that. So if your procurement process is not done correctly, if, for instance, your wealth period was not met correctly, know that the contract in itself is invalid. And that also then links to the fourth process, right, to say that if you don't follow the process that you yourself in your wisdom set for yourself, because remember, no one, in most of the times, there are certain things that you put in place there because you want to have certain turnaround times. If that process that has been set that you've been using in terms of your SEM policy is not followed, then the entire procurement process is invalid. All right. So I want you to remember those four overarching principles. These principles permeate from telecom, they permeate from Gaplin, and they permeate to the Kurulini case and they'll permit to any other case that you need to look at at any time and make sure that you put this into your processes or you think about it at, at all times. Four principles, a decision, 
to award the tender is administrative action. Secondly, once, for instance, the procurement process is done, contract law applies. If the procurement process was not followed correctly, that contract is invalid. And fourthly, if you don't follow the processes that you've set for yourselves, then that procurement process in itself is invalid. So with that lay of the land and with that foundation that you've set, because you, whatever you do, you must always have building blocks. And that's how I also like to do my presentations where perhaps in the beginning, you don't see the picture, but at the end, you see how it all ties in together. Now let's look at how the Ekuruleni case then extended these particular principles. And we start by saying, what is a validity period? Is a validity period a contractual arrangement that you have with bidders and that you must stick to a, to a validity period? So the courts have stated, even in the three cases, that a validity period is a fundamental rule of the game. I'm quoting the case. It says, validity periods, as seen in the telecom case, the Kaplan case, now the Kururini case, is a fundamental rule of the game. Because if you look at the byline of, for instance, the Kuruni case, it says that if, for instance, a validity period expires and was not extended, the tender process has also come to an end, albeit unsuccessfully. Because with the tender process, there's two ways it comes to an end. One, it's a successful or responsive bid. There's a responsive bid. Or two, it's an unsuccessful process or there, was, there were non-responsive bids that were received. So it's quite important from the get-go that we understand that if there's a validity period in place and it comes to an end, then that particular contract, as we have in a procurement space, has also come to an end. So please always remember that the courts have said that the, the validity period is a fundamental, fundamental rule of the game. And if it ends, it ends. But the second part that the court case says, because remember I said to you that, you know, you, you must read the law in a way that is practical, you must read the law in a way that is effective and efficient, unless of the certain restrictions that have been put in place in that regard. So the second element is that when you set a valid period, right, you want to make sure that by the time the validity period is about to end, you've awarded, then there'll be no issues. So if ever you award and the validity period was still running, there's no issues, you move along, not a problem. But the second element and why these cases are quite important, and this is something that we need to think of from you know, an administration point of view. So not administrative law, no, from an administration because procurement has got an administration leg to writing letters, ticking the box in terms of the panel that we met, is that do not send out a notification to extend too late. Do not send a notification to extend the validity period too late. So there's two aspects here that the court dealt with. Firstly, is that if, for instance, there's two or one day left before the validity period ends, if you then send through, for instance, a notification that you want to extend the validity, you are not being practical, you are not being faithful, for instance, to the process, you are just doing it as a means of compliance, but not being practical. Because if today I say bidders um, extend the validity period and the bidder sees it two days later, was that your intention? Is that what you wanted to do? That you said, no, I just notified people that was the end of it? No, it's because you want to make sure that the person you contracted with in the bid process right, is aware well in advance that, for instance, there's still more time needed to evaluate and they need to hang tight because sometimes you know, there are certain suppliers that are really are waiting for this job, so you need to hang tight. But the second part from a practical point of view is that you want to make sure that when a particular bidder tendered, they put in a particular price, let's say on the 1st of Jan, and perhaps on the 1st of April, because you know, lots, 
most lots of things have gone up, they may say, hey, it is no longer viable for me, or I may not make a profit based, for instance, on the price that I gave you. So remember what I said earlier on, is that we need to be fair, not only to ourselves for the business, but we also need to be fair to prospective bidders or prospective suppliers, as it were, to make sure that we also don't make, uh, make them end up tendering and getting into a contract, getting locked in, and they don't make money out of it, they don't make money out of it, they're not able to deliver, then the entire process comes to an end, albeit after wasting a lot of money, after wasting a lot of time, and also not getting what was required. So always remember that, as the court has clearly said in the Kurumi case, is do not send out notifications to extend the validity too late. So remember that second element as you go along your journey. So for instance, I would say, you know, about four, three to four weeks, you can already see now, we're not gonna make it. Already start that, and make sure that you inform them accordingly. The third thing that I found quite interesting in this case, and something that I want you to think about and apply yourselves, I might not have answers to this at this particular point in time, is that the wording, the wording of that letter or the wording of that notification is key. The wording is key, what not you say in that particular notification. So if I read, for instance, what in this particular case was said, it was to say, we require confirmation from all bidders by a set date that you are comfortable with the validity period being extended. So can you see, these are very absolute terms. These are, these are very specific terms. We are saying everyone, so here already we're saying every single bidder needs to respond. But I'm sure you know from a practical point of view and you've had lots of experience here, it's not all the time that all bidders respond. So here, how, do, how, how can we deal with this? You know, because also you don't want to also end up making it one of those say, I've notified you, whether they respond or not, I don't care. But let's be clear that, you know, you know, if we get, for instance, the majority of the bidders responding as an example, then we can extend the validity period and those who didn't respond and then perhaps are successful, then they can say, I decline to take this particular contract. But the wording is quite key. And the court here said that you said everyone must respond. Therefore, by saying everyone must respond, we're holding it to that. And in this instance, not everyone responded. And secondly, you went ahead and stated that they must all respond within a particular date. So this one is an interesting one in the sense that it's good to say that please respond by this particular date. Otherwise, we will assume that you are comfortable with us extending this validity period. That then covers you in that respect. And as I said, with this one, or I may not have all the answers, but I'm reading it from how the case is structured, is that we are saying by a particular date, Everyone must have responded. If you have not responded, we will not disqualify you. It's perfectly fine, but we will stick to what your bid said. And should you be a successful, we'll hold you to what you said in your particular bid. In this way, one, it's not being left open-ended because uh, the, the court was very clear to say that the procurement process is not an open-ended process. It must come to an end. It must have timelines that come to an end. So please make sure that you look at, for instance, how you word these notifications. So not only must you send them on time, but also you must make sure that you word them in such a way that you're not uh, painting yourself in a box and you're not able to, to then have a validity period extended just because one out of 10, for instance, service providers did not respond. So please, on this one, please remember that because you must be as practical as possible so that you don't get stuck. The fourth one, sorry about that. The fourth one, which is quite key, is you cannot extend something that has expired. You cannot extend something that has expired. You are not, for instance, able to uh, bring Lazarus back to life. Right, I think let's, talk, let's, talk, let's, let's call this the Lazarus principle. So with the Lazarus principle is to say that Lazarus had died for many days and then was, was, was resurrected 
and and was able to live a normal life. So that that is fine from a biblical point of view. But in terms of contract law, and for those who are lawyers in the room, this is one thing that you're taught in contract law is that you can't extend a dead contract. You can't extend a contract that is expired. So in the, with that very same principle and thinking about a validity period or the tender process as being a contractual arrangement, you also can't extend a validity period after the fact. So you can't say, yes, the validity period ended on the 30th of March, but I got a response from one of the bidders on the 2nd of April, therefore the validity period is, is back on. No. It meant that on the 30th of March, when the clock struck midnight and it became, for instance, 1 April, that validity period came to an end and as such, the tender process was concluded, albeit unsuccessfully. So remember that you can't extend something that is dead. And I know sometimes, you know, we, we do take this for granted. Sometimes we don't even check the timelines. And I can see here, they were not quite checking the timelines. And it happens. I mean, there's a lot of tenders that we get. There's a lot of things uh, there's a lot of balls in the air, for instance. But just make sure that if you've got some form of tracking system, please make sure that you have it in place. It could be a manual one, it could be a system one, whatever works for your organization, perfectly fine. But whatever you do, remember you can't extend the validity period once it is expired. And in this Akurulini case, as an example, uh, when Eurocon finally responded, it was after the validity period had actually come to end. So it's quite important for us to remember that. The next and last aspect that I want us to, 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 to unpack, because I want to make sure that there's enough time for, 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 for questions. You know, it's always, as a presenter, you know, you can always fill up the entire time and not, not have any questions. I still want to be grilled on what I've said today. And I, I, I'm sure the questions that are coming up there. The last element that this court case dealt with, and it's again, something that we see a lot in contract law. So we'll see that there's similarities on how the court dealt with this case with contract law is that you cannot retrospectively extend a validity period. So you, it might sound like a similar point that I'm making, but I'm sure many of you have heard about backdating. Right? I'm sure a lot of you have heard about backdating. They're now backdating this particular letter so that it's as if it was sent on time. So the court says here that no backdating of extensions from a bidder no retrospective application of, of extending the validity period, actually to the extent that you don't even have the power in terms of the law to do a retrospective extension of a validity period. So I want us to also remember that, 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 that particular part. So just to recap on the principles that are specific to this particular case, as I had done with the overarching principles earlier on, is that one, the validity period in a procurement process is a fundamental rule of the game. So it's not one that you can just dispense off or not follow to the T as you've set it out yourself. So remember that, that's the first point. The second point is don't send notifications late. So it's like anything else that, you know, you need to be timelessly. So for instance, with SARS, you know, if you submit your returns late, there might be consequences for you in that respect. So don't send out notifications late. The third one, remember this one, and some that we still need to debate a bit more, is wording is key. So the content of your notification or the content of your letter is key, such that you don't paint yourself into a corner, but also it must not be to the extent that the wording is so, uh, is so flexible that you know it doesn't give uh, effect to what you're trying to achieve because there's still rules that you still need to follow. The fourth one is that the Lazarus principle is you can't resuscitate something that is dead. So as such, if a validity period is ended, you can't resuscitate it. So remember that because once it ends, the court says the, that validity period has ended and the procurement process has ended, albeit unsuccessfully. And the third point there is, and the last point I mean, is that you can't do a backdating or a retrospective type of extension where you say, no, please take it as if I had uh, sent this letter at this particular date, or you as the, as, as, as the contracting authority say, no, I'm taking this letter as if it was sent on a particular, on a particular day. So that's, that's, that's basically the long and short of 
what I wanted to, to present to you firstly was to lay the, was the lay of the land as it relates to you know the practical elements of public procurement and our public procurement is an enabler of business and therefore must work with business all times. And by doing so, I unpacked the five elements that we see in the constitution on how procurement must work and then dovetailed it back into how we implement the four Ps because the four Ps then link quite nicely into the four overarching principles that the courts have set over the years. And then finally came up with the five aspects that the current court case then dealt with as it relates, for instance, to what else we need to think about from a practical level. So I hope, you know, I've tried to practicalize this case as much as possible and I've avoided using legalese because I, I, I feel that lawyer who uses legalese uh, can, 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 can actually lose the audience in that, in, 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 in that regard. So make sure that with regards to the validity period, right? You set the validity period because you're being practical because you need to have quick turnaround times, but also that your extension of that validity period is not too long. So please don't say, no, initially the validity period was 180 days, I'm extending for another 180 days. It takes you out for a year. And I don't think if, if, if a service can wait a year before it can be put in place, you really needed a service. Or if there's a service provider that was already there, right, within that particular period of time, then they get an unfair advantage for an extra year and ultimately might get a year in that regard. So yeah, that's the principles that I wanted to, to, to state. And then now I'll hand over back to Henry and I'll take out my notepad and note the questions and answer them as we go. Thanks. Thank you all. So that was, that was super. That was actually fantastic in terms of just giving us the, the overall concept and the principles to, to apply to. I think there were quite a few um, questions in the chat and I'll, I'll pick up on some of them, but I see Sonelli's hand is up. So maybe um, hand over to you, Sonelli, your question and then we can pick up some of the other questions in the chat. Sonelli. Thanks, uh, thanks, Henry. Good morning, colleagues. Um, yeah, quite a very uh, informative uh, presentation from from our colleague. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I think Henry, uh, what my point that I actually I wanted to raise comes from a, a point of the procurement uh, regulator. I, I want to pose this comment, colleagues. Do you see it's necessary to have procurement regulator at this point, uh, in a sense of the tribunal that we have here in case of I'm saying this because if you look at the date of advertisement of this tender, it was in 2020, March 2020. And this matter has only been finalized this year. You see, it, it poses so much inconvenience from the side of the service delivery, from the side of deliverables of the municipalities, and for the size of the business. If you award this tender now, let's say this, the courts didn't find anything wrong with this tender and it gets to be awarded. It, it, won't, it wouldn't have made any business sense because in March uh, 2020, prices were very fair and we got hit by COVID, things weren't out of control. Prices are not normal and <clears throat> For me, that's the point that I wanted to start with, that we do need this to try and, and solve these problems because I think at a tribunal level, these things would have been corrected. Although it won't be a, 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 a last resort, but it would have been a, a, some sort of a solution. But I wanted to raise these questions, a few questions. I know my colleague uh, Walter uh, covered some, but I wanted to get some clarity because we always find these questions. So, what happens um, in a case where bidders are requested to submit a validity? Let me put it in a sense where we are buying most of the imported stuff. Uh, let's say I'm doing a computer refresh at a project where most of the stuff is imported and there is no other way uh, we, are we are detected by the rent dollar exchange. And if the service providers are saying, uh, 
since we are asking us to extend the validity, we are unable to extend the validity because of the market have changed and we will not be able to service you. We propose to amend our prices. Let's say you get those uh, proposal from the service provider when you're trying to deal with your validity. What happens to that? That will be the first question. And then the second one, uh, I just want to understand during this court process running uh, from 20, uh, 2020, I guess, uh, until 2022, were the bids kept valid? Um, for instance, I know the question was, was, was based on the validity. Uh, let's say now the court found in favor of the municipality. Were they going to be able to add those bids? Were, were they remain valid uh, in the period of a court proceeding? Or let me make it a, a different example because the, bid, the, the, the argument was, was about the validity which actually lapsed. Let's say the court case was about a bid and the bid was still valid and it was based on another matter. Where, where, where was the municipality supposed to keep, keep those bid valid for the duration of the court process until the final judgment of that court process? Or then it, the municipality had to say, okay, because the, the, the proceedings are, are with the court, we will just take it as the service provider. No. And um, yeah. I think that, that, let me stop there for now, uh, colleagues. I'll, I'll appreciate the comments from there. Um, I don't know, Andy, if you want, if I can respond and then we go to the next one, is that fine? Of course, that's fine. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah, I think that would be, yeah, make it easier so we also don't lose some of those very important aspects. So, you know, you, you, you've raised some very fantastic points and I, I, I like it because you're thinking in a very practical manner and that's how it should be. So on the first one, on the need of having a procurement regulator, and obviously if you look at the, uh, the, the, procurement, the procurement bill, as it was at that point in time, what it, it sought to do is that it would take some of these elements that are now being dealt with by the courts. Because remember, at the moment, if, for instance, you are, are, are unhappy with the procurement process, right? There's nothing else you can do but go to court. Because remember, if it's an administrative action, right? Only if there's another body or another power that you have to deal with, for instance, the disgruntled bidder, you can't do anything. You must just go to court. And that's why sometimes you find some of ours. Of, of, of the companies actually taking themselves themselves to court to, to withdraw a particular contract that they've awarded. So if you look at the Transnet case, for instance, if you look at the Prasa case, they took themselves to court to say, we awarded this tender, but in terms of part we can't withdraw from this, we need the court to tell us to do so. And that then means that, uh, linked to your second point, that if it's a court case that, for instance, starts in the high court and people are unhappy with the response, they go to the Supreme Court, they're not happy with the response there, they go to the Constitutional Court, it's very easy to actually spend five years on one case. And your observation is spot on to say too much time lapses. And having, for instance, a separate body, a separate, like, uh, for instance, quasi-judicial forum that, for instance, as you related to the, uh, to the tribunal in case that you spoke about, uh, means that you can have, for instance, a forum that specifically deals with procurement matters. So first and foremost, you've got a very focused type of approach. Secondly, you've got individuals there that day in, day out, deal specifically with procurement matters and therefore build their capacity specifically towards procurement matters. So if you look at, for instance, with, with, with SARS, they would have, for instance, a tax court as an example, where only tax matters are dealt with, and therefore it makes it easier for you to have more nuanced discussions within that regard. So, and then also it means that you, you become more expedient and more effective in that cases then can be dealt with quicker. So if, for instance, today I say I'm not happy with the tender process and I submit my my files by the end of the month, and the, the body is another month to decide. That's a maximum of two months that have lapsed, and the, Im the impact is minimal, as opposed to having a five-year process in that regard. So for me, 
I'm a big uh, uh, proponent or a big supporter of having specialized, for instance, procurement quasi-judicial forums. And only if those quasi-judicial forums then can't do the matter, then after that, the matter can go to court. But the court must also then apply itself to say, is it necessary for me to hear this case? Or did the previous court deal with it accurately and cut it off at that stage? The second one that you spoke about is with relation to say that, you know, what if a bidder then comes and says, you know, because uh, the, the, the market forces have changed, the, the rent to dollar exchange has moved to extend that I now can no longer afford to actually give you this particular service. And it happens to be every bidder because sometimes when you, when you procure, for instance, technologies, you would procure them from overseas and all bidders might, are, 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 are vulnerable to those market fluctuations. And the tender process ends because, I mean, there's no one else who can, who can, who can, who can service you. But let's say not everyone pulls out and some stay behind, then you would still then be able to follow through with those ones that have caught at that particular, uh, particular point in time. But I think what happens sometimes is that some of these bidders actually insist on having a contractual clause that says that you will pay me a uh, subject to, for instance, uh, fluctuations. But a lot of organizations also are not allowed to hedge because that's a form of hedging as well. Uh, some would rather just have a set, for instance, dollar amount in that regard, but obviously a national treasury must be able to come in to give you the necessary approvals in that regard. And then the last one, which is quite, a, quite an important one, and um, like, luckily I, I did find out last week, is your question is, during a court case, what happens? Does, do we then indefinitely uh, extend the validity period until such time that the court comes to a decision? Um, or do we go ahead and appoint and see how things go at the end? So with this particular case, remember an award was made and then the challenge came. The same providers that we appointed have been doing work since that day. So if you say it was 2020, these service providers have done almost 24 months of a 36 month contract. So if you remember, this contract was for 36 months. And at this stage, I'm sure they've finished about 24 months. So it goes back to your question is, does it make sense? Because there was no one who said, while this court case is going on, and you can do that in law, while this court case is going on, and everything must stop. But also the courts don't grant such orders because it then means that as a service, pro, as, a, as, a, as a worker of state, you're sitting there, not getting a critical service that you might need for service delivery. So that's the best way to, to answer you. And thanks for those very interesting uh, questions. I uh, can get the next one. Thanks. Um, just just before Tandy, maybe just wanted to 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 this one question from Mantla, um, and it and it's kind of related to that uh, fluctuation, but slightly different. Um, what if the pricing, because now you've extended for quite a few times and it's now almost a, a year since the contract originally closed. In that case, you know, and I can't afford that anymore. What, what happens in a case like that? How do we, would that be kind of, could I then regard that as unfair as I say, I cannot do it under the same pricing anymore? Uh, which was basically the, the gist of that question. Yeah, no, thanks. And so, 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 so the courts have dealt with the two ends of the spectrum. One, the courts have dealt with abnormally low bids, where you're saying, but the bid, the bid amount that you've given here doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And I think it was in the Eastern Cape, in this particular case. And the court said, if someone submits an abnormally low uh, bid, you must go back and verify to make sure that they understand what they bid it for. So that's the other end of the spectrum. The, other end of the spectrum now speaks to now, you know, things have become so unaffordable. And I remember the first day there was a court case um, where, for instance, the, the, the one of the departments there said, no, we, can, we can't afford this and therefore we won't pay you a dime more because of statutory illegality, right? And in that, in that particular point in time, the court said, no, you can't just rely on statutory illegality you need to show that there's an affordability element to this thing, and we need to find an equitable way of dealing with this particular matter. And in that case, the service provider won. So, but ultimately as a procurement specialist, you know, if for instance, something becomes unaffordable, right? You know, it's, it, 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 we've had cases where a tender has been canceled because the bids that were received 
the amounts that were, that were submitted as, as, as bid amounts were too excessive to the extent that as, a, as, as, as an organ of state, you can't be able to, to, to go ahead. So affordab the affordability test is one that is quite critical at all times, and you must be open uh, and, and upfront with products and service providers that this is subject to a particular uh, particular budget. And if, if, if you can't meet that particular budget, then that particular process uh, can't go ahead. Um, other than just tying yourself in and you know you can't afford it and then you end up being taken to court and sued for the remainder of that particular thing. So always as, a, as a, during the planning phase, as I said earlier on, see what your budget is, see what your budget is, and then deal with it accordingly throughout the, the tender process. If, for instance, uh, it's above your budget and you've got the powers to, for instance, increase the threshold of your budget through the, no, the, the, the channels that you have within your organ of state, then do so. But if you can't afford it, don't contract. Thank you. Thank you. Sandy, you, maybe over to you and then I'll bring in one of the questions in the chat later on. Okay. Uh, thanks, Henry. It's a follow-up question actually on, on, on the whereby bidders are requested to extend their validity. And then one of the bidders says, I cannot extend this. It's maybe not financially feasible for me, reasonable, whatever the case may be. And I'm not sure if I've heard you correctly, Walter, to say that if I decide then I'm not going to extend my validity, it means that the organ of state can continue with the others. And now my question is on the principle you were talking about fairness. Is it fair to me that I'm being taken out of the race because people took long to comply with the rules that they set for themselves? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the sound was a bit shaky, but I think I got the gist of what you were you were you, you were saying. So, so you remember from what I said about the, the the wedding as an example of your notification. So, first and foremost, if for instance one bidder comes back and says no, uh, I'm, I'm one I'm not interested in in this particular tender anymore. Obviously, that's an easy one. Uh, they are gone. The second one is that no, nope, I'm no longer accepting. Uh, I'm, I'm no longer willing to give you my bid at this particular price. I want to amend. Then we need to look at whether there is a framework for amendment of 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 bids during an evaluation process. So you will have, for instance, some organ of state that can do so, and then they submit a, a revised, for instance, a code. So you need to be able to make sure that the wording makes sure one. If someone wants to come out of the race because they're like, ah, I'm not interested, in, interested anymore, that's perfectly fine. But second, if they come and say, no, I'm not willing to hold my price, I want to revise it, then let's let's allow them to do so. Whether to be there to their detriment or not, that's neither here nor there, but it, we must make sure that we put in place those measures to make sure that it's done in as fair uh, possible manner as possible, but also be transparent about it so that all other bidders are aware of what is, uh, is going on. So that's how, if I caught your, caught your question correctly, that's how I would deal with, with that particular aspect. Thanks. Uh, Brian, over to you. Listen to this. Um, the related part seems to be a function of the precision of the evaluation criteria. Um, I so can't hear. Uh, let me, uh, let me go. Okay. Um, Brian? I'll come back later. I'll write in the chat. Okay. Okay. We will pick it up. Here. May, over, uh, May, maybe you can uh, ask your question. Um, good morning, colleagues. Um, just a clarity question. Firstly, I'd just like to request the citation of the case for we, we have a similar concern. But secondly, in the event that um, the court then finds that the validity period was had elapsed when the extension was effected, right? And obviously then it, that nullifies the bidding process and looking at the timelines that we're working on it's three to five years later, what is then becomes the recourse and what becomes the position of the public institution insofar as the contracted parties who've been carrying the, the contract in the past three to five years pending the matter being heard by various courts? And then what happens to the parties that maybe could have been disputing this process? So how does the court handle such as um, in the event that the outcome is that the invalid, the validity period had expired? Thank you. 
No, thanks. That's 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 key. So the citation of the case. I'm assuming you want the one about the abnormally low bids. I will I will I will give it to you. Not a problem. Uh, and then secondly, um, so for instance, let's take this part, this particular case that we have before us right now to say that there was a bid that was not awarded this tender, and we took this matter to court. And on the other side, there are two successful bidders that have been doing work for two thirds of this particular of this particular contract. So first and foremost, the bidder that challenged this and was an unsuccessful one um, is merely seeking that this particular tender process start again, right? So they will not have any other further recourse except that they just want a new process to start and for them to submit. And it could still come up that they don't even win that particular tender or if they do win, then it is the one in that regard. So that's the first part I wanted to say that with regards to such cases, there would be no recourse to say, but you know, I could have been getting this work for the last two years because the court doesn't deal with matters like that on the what ifs. And that's why I gave the example of that new case on the out of pocket expenses. In that regard, the recourse was to say, at no fault of me as the service provider at that point in time, I'd put in place certain infrastructure, for instance, and I want to at least be reimbursed for my out of pocket expenses. The second layer to your question is that let, now I'm, I was a successful bidder, I've been doing this work for two years. So it means that obviously for the two years, there's nothing that you must pay there because you were delivering in terms of the contract. It's just that for now, the contract would have to come to an end until such time that the new contract is put in place when the new tender process happens. So from a practical level, for instance, I would say that maybe for instance, you could do a short term contract with the current service providers until such time that the, tender, the new tender process comes to an end, or I advertise for a short term, for instance, contract, and then everybody wants to service me for a year while I'm finalizing this particular bid, uh, is actually able to bid in that regard. So, but there's no actual recourse where you say, no, we'll give you additional money or whatever the case may be, no, that, that won't happen. But that's a, that's a good question, thanks. Thank you. Um, just before I get, hand over to the bellow, maybe just uh, two questions that I've, we've got in the chat. The one was um, around uh, the duration, that validity period. So it starts obviously on the bit closing, but then do you measure that up to the time of the award letter or up to the time of the contract signature? What does the court tell us about, you know, in this particular case? What is that? period is it the award or is it yeah. contract yeah yeah so so with regards to the telecom gaplin and the Gurini case uh, they seem to say that the award is where it comes to an end so up until you award that's the validity period once you award it means that the contractual arrangement to finish the procurement process has come to an end and i've awarded to so and so and then you can still have time to contact after that without necessarily having to extend. But that's how the court is actually looking at it. Thank you, thank you. And then another quick one, this should be a pretty quick one. Somebody's asking about an, an unlimited validity period. So for example, you make it like a validity period of 380 days or 400 days, whatever. You know, um, what, what about something like that? Uh, is that something that would be okay? Yeah. So, so when you talk about unlimited valid period, it reminds me of a case that came out yesterday in relation to, 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 to Transnet, Sasol, and your, and your total about the evergreen contract that's been running since 1967. Uh, if you find time, please, please, please read, read that case. Uh, you will see I'm, I'm a person who likes we like explaining through the court cases. So having an unlimited validity period is something that would be deemed as unreasonable. The courts would not want you to have unlimited validity period. That's why you know, in how we work, we put in set times, 180 days. And even when you extend a validity period, it must not be to the extent that it's another 180 days, as I said earlier on, we, or have unlimited, uh, it must be based on sound, logical, reasonable uh, decision, because there's another case I think that talks about, because it's a PAJA, it's subject to PAJA, right? You need to make sure that whatever extensions that you do, whatever value security put in place is rational and reasonable. So from the planning phase, the court will interrogate from the planning phase, 
why the hell did you end up having an unlimited validity period when you know that such things need to be done quickly? Are you saying that perhaps this service is not so urgent and you, or it's, it's not something that you require and you're just going through the motion? So unlimited validity periods are something that the courts based on PAJA would definitely frown upon. And also it's not fair on, 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 on service providers as I said earlier on as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tabela, uh, over to you now. Thank you. you. Uh, good day, colleague. I, I just want to maybe go back to a statement that you made uh, uh, post-submission or post-closure of bids and, and being, allowing a service provider to make uh, a revision to that bid pricing uh, based on, on the time that has lapsed, you know, that is no longer valid. Uh, you spoke about framework. Uh, what framework is that? I, 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 in, I've been in the CM for quite of some time and I, I have never in any case seen anything that allows a revision of, of, of tender prices once the bid is closed. And what aspect to fairness will that be if you allowed one service provider to revise that bid when they've taken sight of everybody else's pricing which has been published? Surely the, 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 that's, that's, that's an issue that, that cannot be allowed. It will mean that everybody is allowed to revise their bids. And if that's the case, then that, that's a new tender. That tender should be closed. None of the bids that were submitted are still valid. Uh, can you just maybe touch back on that subject matter? Because I think it's quite a funny issue for me. No, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tabela. So, so when I spoke of a framework, I was saying, if, for instance, your own organ of state has such a framework, and obviously with such frameworks, you know, it's something that must always be tested with, for instance, uh, a, a national treasury to make sure that they also give you the go ahead. But at a principal level, Tabela, to raise something quite key is to say, I come to you and say, you know, you guys are taking a year uh, to finalize this particular bid and it's no longer affordable to me. So I will still want to give the service, but I'm not going to be able to give you this particular service at a particular price, right? So that's why I spoke about one, the affordability one, you know, you need to look at is the, if, if people revise their bids, would it be affordable? But secondly, you speak about the fact that perhaps, you know, other bidders, and remember, you don't only limit this to the one who raised the concern. When you talk about fairness, equity, and transparency, it means what, have, what you do for the ghost, you must do for the gander. So if ever there was a, an approval that you got from a national treasury, for instance, to say, yes, because of this, because it's taken so long, and the, the service providers we can see can give the service, but the only thing that we've taken so long, for whatever reason, we want them to be able to revise and make sure that our budget is also revised accordingly. And I think it's something that must be looked into. I fully appreciate and I fully understand that, you know, we, there are very stringent uh, rules that, that we live by. But I, I always say that if ever there's a, a way to be as practical as possible to deal with things, before we jump to counseling that particular tender, let's engage, for instance, the legislative owner to see if there's a way. If they say, no, this can't be done, then it's, it can't be done. But if ever there's a revision of price by one, it must be a revision of price uh, by all. But obviously, that's, that's also me also trying to think outside the box with regards to zone. But let's see. I mean, it's something that we can test. But thanks for that, Antavina. I, I like that question. Just, just maybe a last one, if you may allow me. Sure. Uh, you know, one of the principles that you, that goes with fairness is that when you go out to a tender, it's, it's, it's transparent to the world, right? It is not just transparent for the interested bidders that bid at that point in time. And once that tender, as far as the original submissions was made, becomes invalid and everybody else wants to revise that, uh, that, that tender prices, then the question yeah. is, if everybody out in the world also knew there was an opportunity again to retender for the same service, you might just find that it would actually be fair that everybody else that has been excluded or that could intend at that particular time due to the particular circumstances that they might have been in, that they would now be ready to tender for such a thing. So would yeah. it not make sense for you to do a consolation if you could not complete within that particular time frame, especially if one of the bidders says, no, it's unfair for me to revise, uh, to, 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 I cannot handle this service at this particular, at the same uh, tender price. Therefore, you should go out into the market and, and allow everybody else an opportunity. Uh, you cannot, you know, create a, 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 a an opportunity for those that were just involved in the process, because that in itself is an element of unfairness. That's just my last question. Thanks. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I'm fully on board with you on this one, uh, Tabitha. So obviously, it's always great to then test it um, as far as possible. It's an idea that I've thrown in there to say, you know, is it practical? Because also remember, as they're still crafting this procurement bill, 
you know, let's see if there's other things that could make it easier. Because one of the things that we hear quite a lot is a lot of people are frustrated with some of the limitations. And yes, at that point in time, they were put in place to elevate the principles of fairness, but are there ways that are more flexible that can still give rise to flexibility? And I think perhaps, you know, let's, let's debate this and see how we can make it as fair as possible. Because obviously when I say revise the, 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 the price, not the scope, but the price, for me is to say, is, is to make sure that, you know, this process also doesn't take longer than, than it should be. But I think let's have this, let's do this debate and go along with it and see if we can come up with innovative ways. But I like, I like, I like your thinking of that. Thanks, thanks, Tabel. Over to you, no question. Yeah, Hello, Didu, are you still there? Hello, Didu? Uh, it seems Didu is not. Uh, anyway. um, also, there was a question from Ronelle. I don't know if Ronelle is still Ronelle Leo. If she's still around. So maybe Ronelle, if you want to just uh, maybe state your, your point there, if you're still around. Um, yes, thank you so much. Um, no, my question was um, just around the judgment, um, the, the particular case. And it was just that in that particular judgment, it says that unless there is a time is request and favorable response from all the tenderers prior to the expiry of the tender, the tender comes to an end. So yeah, my question was just around that particular point in the judgment. It is quite clear that the tender should come to an end. However, um, you have indicated that one can still proceed. So yeah, my, my question is also more linking to, to Tabella's inquiry. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks for that. So I think the third point that I raised from the CAT case specifically, uh, was, a, was, was in response to that particular uh, part of the court case. So in this particular situation with the Guru Lin, the notification that was given to all the, the bidders is to say, all bidders must, for instance, respond by a set date. So the court can't then read in to say some of the bidders must then uh, respond. And for me, it was to say that Let's try and work around the wording of this thing because sometimes you might have a service provider, maybe the person who is receiving the email is out of town for two weeks and they don't get to see this particular letter coming from you. And then now we end up saying well, the entire process is, 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 is ended because one person did not respond. What we've done, what we've seen a lot of the times, a lot of organs of state, what they do is they, 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 they paint themselves in that corner and say, all of you at the date must respond, all right? Whereas I'm saying maybe we should then look at a different way to say perhaps we've even in the rules in the beginning to say that should there be an, an request for extension by date. So maybe from the get-go when, when in your bid documents, we, we, if we get perhaps the majority of the bidders responding, then obviously the, the validity period goes ahead. So for me, it's just, I wanted to make sure that we come up with new ways try and work around some of the situations that have led to some of our tenders lapsing, whereas we could have, could have done it quite, 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 quite differently. So that's how I would say, but for, the, for this particular case, yes, they had said all and the court stuck to all. But if you come to court with a different case and say, but we said some, or we said the majority, then the court will then read it as majority and not as, uh, as all. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Walter. And Kuli, over to you. You got a question or a comment? Okay, thanks. Good morning to all. My question is around the extension of validity. Remember you mentioned that the yesterday's court on transmit regarding the unlimited validity. Now, my question is, does extending three times or more uh, validity mean that it is regarded as unlimited? Because sometimes 120 to 180 validity days might not be sufficient uh, to conclude the process. That is why we end up having multiple extensions of validity. Is that regarded as unlimited? Because sometimes we, we receive voluminous tenders, maybe say maybe um, 4,000 responses. 
obviously you wouldn't be able to finalize the process within mm. 180 or more. So yeah. what's your yeah. take? You know, thanks, thanks, thanks for that question. And I, I have seen, you know, some of those where sometimes it went as far as five, five, five extensions. So there's two ways to answer this. The first one is to say at the point that you went out on tender. You may not have anticipated that 1,000 bidders will submit bids. That's one. Or two, you didn't anticipate that some bidders would send voluminous 4,000 page uh, types of documents. So initially, you're wondering right? So already at that point in time, or 12 extension, I see. Already at that point in time, you start saying 180 days might not be sufficient, right? So even within the first week you can see there's no ways we're going to meet even if we're ambitious here based on because remember you've also got the the, the, the the historical intelligence here on how you've dealt with similar types of tenders and how much time it took to go through a, a 1000 page document or to go through 1000 bidders of a similar type of, of submission so already there you can say no uh, based on what i can i can foresee that this would we have to move from 180 days for instance uh, to for instance 240 days, it depends. It depends uh, what you want to do. So, so that's the first part that has to, to, to understand. But sometimes you are ambitious and you truly believe that you can finish within the first 180 days, you extend for another 30 days uh, as, as an example, and already see hey, it's not gonna work. So, so, so I think, you know, it will be important from the get go to try and see how far you can strike it. And this also depends on what your, 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 your rules or your policies say with regards to how long can one extension be. I see someone says, you know, some uh, allow for time. And they need to interrogate, you know, is this an absolute rule or can we go to the provincial treasury as you put it to say for this one, because of the reasons, because you must, be, you, must, you must also use uh, the rationality test here to say, yes, you know, uh, normally, we do 30 day increments at a time, but because of the nature and the complexity of this particular case, can we get a deviation from that 30 day increment and perhaps make it a 60 day? And should we need to come back, we come back again. So that we can limit the number of extensions as, as much as possible. But to get specific to a point is, do multiple extensions mean that it's unlimited? No, it's not unlimited because you keep setting dates but it must not be to the extent that it becomes unreasonable, to the extent that it becomes impractical, to the extent that you know even bitters start falling away because you're taking too long in that regard. But try your best to set uh, a, an upper limit uh, to say this is the, the first, first you want to get to with regards to evaluating. But obviously each case must be dealt with on its merits and perhaps the different dependencies that might deviate from that particular situation. But but yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate that there are some frameworks or rules that say 30 day increments at the time. There are some that say, nope, one extension, that's it. And then you try and work around that. So that's something that at least you can engage your provincial treasuries, your national treasuries to try and assist uh, with regards to making it as practical as possible. Then I keep raising engaging the national treasuries and your provincial treasuries because as much as they're the ones who issue instruction notes, as much as they're the ones who talk with the regulations, as much as they're the ones who talk with the law, we need to be able to give them back the intelligence to say, yes, in two, in, was it 1999? Yeah, it was in 1999. You said in the PFA we must do A, B, C, and D. It's now 2022. Please amend the, the act. If it's something in the regulations, these regulations have been there since, for instance, 2004. It's no longer practical. Amend it. If it's an instruction note, revoke it. So, so I, I want to see a point whereby these engagements are more frequent to try and see how we can influence your treasury to be able to assist you as, 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 as best as possible. But yeah, that's how I'd best answer your question in that regard. Thank you. Over to you, Karabo, and then I've got another question. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you, Walter, as well, for the informative uh, presentation on that. Uh, I think my question goes back to the to the to the recourse um, of 
of a being of good feelings and justified by the um, by the process. So I come from a municipal environment, and there's a provision within the MFMA that uh, says leaders can raise complaints and or object to the process if they feel they are grounds to do so, right? Uh, and I think there's also parallel to the departure process, which I've never tested in terms of lodging objection. So I think, yeah, uh, I wanted to just maybe um, see whether it, it, you've had any experience with that, because you mentioned earlier that usually the recourse is, um, you know, mostly they go to court uh, bidders, but that, that process, it has never. I'm not sure if it, if it has ever been fully tested in, within your within your world. And I was hoping you could maybe share some experiences around that, because I had a situation where I was contacted by a colleague who's in the field who represented a client who said uh, he was a participating uh, bidder in a process where he didn't get um, awarded the tender, but. Um, he got informed after the award that uh, it could have been, or he was, he could have been the successful bidder, except someone was put in line, he was overlooked. Someone was put in line who didn't um, have their tax matters in order. It so turns out that that information was correct, and that bidder then took uh, the municipality on, and they, they then conceded that yes, the information you know that you have is correct this data should not have been awarded to begin with but then the question was what what happens and i know you mentioned things around practicality the issue of timing and all of that because then the question was what powers do to uh, this um i don't know what to call them because they can i call this person a chairperson of an uh, appeal process but it's not an appeal process it's just a a, a, a process to lodge objections within the, the, the MFMA environment. So what powers do they have uh, bearing in mind that, uh, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't really stipulate, you know, you know, once you've lodged a complaint and your complaint is valid, what can then be done? Uh, so I think that was a question that was posed to me as well, but on behalf of this tender to say, you know, they, they were found with their court and in court with their pens down, literally, and they were like, ah, yeah. Uh, they, they didn't seem to be able to, to have a way of addressing this. I don't know, was I audible? Yes, 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 you were. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll answer this in twofold. So if you look at the, 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 the procurement bill, it specifically puts in place an appeal mechanism where, for instance, a process stops as soon as there's an appeal, and then an appeal is heard expeditiously, and then the process continues after that. Either you know you change your decision or you continue with your with your actual decision. When you talk about the municipal space, and I think something that has dealt with uh, in terms of section, I think section 62 of the Municipal Systems Act where there is a, 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 an appeal mechanism that can be done, for instance, if a decision is taken, for instance, by a municipal manager, right? But I think the courts have said that there's no specific appeal mechanism that speaks specifically to, to for instance, a procurement process. And therefore, you know, that we can't say that there's a, an appeal process specifically for, for, for procurement. And that is the reason why, for instance, people automatically go to court. The second layer to that is that obviously, whenever an administrative decision is taken, it is regarded in law as being functus officio. So it means that the decision is valid at that point in time, and that valid that decision cannot be changed unless set aside by a court of law. The only other exception to functus officio is if, for instance, you have in your legal framework a way to vary or change, for instance, your administrative uh, decision. That is why, for instance, the procurement bill 
then wants to change that and say that we've got a specific appeal mechanism with regards to that. And that is why I think most of the times, even when you look at the court cases, you never hear that, no, we, they try to resolve it first before it went to court. It goes directly to court. But I guess, you know, it's some, I guess more people need to test that section 62 to say, but maybe, you know, it, it does. But I think also section 62 speaks specifically, you know, in terms of those with a delegated authority to be able to hear these particular, these particular appeals. Because if you're, if for instance, you appeal, you would be appealing, for instance, to the very same municipal manager as an example. But I guess uh, that section 62 argument is the one that you want to the procurement bill by actually putting a, a standalone uh, uh, process for appeal so that at least um, one can deal with it without necessarily going to court. But that's, that's, that's how I'd answer you, Laura. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm aware that you already you've committed to you know our half and we are kind of exceeding that. So I'm gonna maybe allow can you see Steely if it's okay if it's the last question and then and we'll wrap up. Okay. Okay, hello. Okay, can I still see you unmuted, but we can't hear you. Hi, Henry, I think we should uh, close off now. We're not going to get yeah. to see it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, Walter, wow, what, what's a wonderful session. What a great session, such a lot of insight. Um, I would... I'm sure we would want to get you back in. Would you prepare at some other point? Uh, to, please. Uh, yes, please. I'm very much prepared, especially, you know, I want to have debates with, with, with Tabir. Yes, Tabir, I'm, I'm, I'm a liberal lawyer. And yes, as an organization, we look at it black and white because at the moment, we do what is before us as the law. But I'm always advocating for us to be as flexible as possible with procurement. And that starts with the legislative owner changing it. And then we come in as AG to audit after the fact. But yeah, I'm very much interested in coming back and having more debates. Thanks. Thank you again. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, and Rose, a very valuable session. And, and thank you, everybody else, colleagues, for, for your participation. Uh, we will see you again next week. Okay. Thank Thanks you, Henry. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.